I'm Charlotte McLeod with InvestingNews.com, and here today with me are Rob McEwen, Chairman and Chief Owner at McEwen Mining, and Michael Metting, Vice President and General Manager at McEwen Copper. Thank you both for joining me. Great to see you again. Good to see you, Charlotte. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Nice to have you both here, and as usual, we have a lot to talk about. I want to start by going over the macro environment before we get into company developments. So, Rob, it often seems like we're talking during these downtimes for gold, like during the summer when we tend to have lower prices. Looking at the current lull, I wonder if for you that's related to seasonality? Is it because we're waiting for the U.S. Federal Reserve to make its next move? Is it related to something else entirely? What are your thoughts there on what we're seeing from gold? I believe it's a seasonal low. If you look at the seasonality of gold, the summer is often um, a point of less interest in uh, weaker prices. And I would expect as we move to September, October, we're going to see a price climbing. And I don't believe that interest rates are going to cause a permanent um, softness in the price. I think it could be temporary, but the trajectory for gold is higher through September, October. So let's move over to looking at McEwen Mining's Q2 results, which came out just recently. So Rob, I think in the release, you talked about Gold Bar in San Jose, which did better in Q2 after a little bit of a rough start to the year. So I would like to know from you if there are any other points of concern to address there. At the moment, we don't see any, Charlotte. Um, at San Jose, it's traditionally uh, the first quarter is a weak quarter for them, but they there was significant increase in production in Q2, and our joint venture partner, Hoshield, who operates the mine, is saying that we should see guidance, production guidance met, although um, costs per ounce may be 10 to 20% higher. Um, at Gold Bar, um, heavy winter snowfall um, impeded mining and adversely affect production and costs. Uh, then in the second quarter, there, I have to laugh at it, but the, there was flooding in the high desert in Nevada due to the melting of the heavy snowfall. And uh, we had to, for at least a week, we had to get to the wharf mine, and this is the desert, by boat. Um, part of the road to the mine was submerged, and so we had to go by boat or helicopter to get to the mine. Um, what we've done to deal with that is we increased the mining rate. We um, we use a contractor to mine, and so he's brought more equipment to site to increase uh, the tonnage for mining in the second half. Uh, there'll be a lower strip ratio, which um, will lower costs, and we're mining a higher grade. So more gold and lower costs and more production. So the second quarter... It's being forecast, it'll be producing twice as much as what we produced in the first quarter in order to make guidance. And at Fox, which didn't mention, but there's our other operation, it's um, right now running slightly ahead of plan. So uh, we're into a higher grade area and again, uh, increased throughput that's leading to that. So everybody seems a little comfortable that we're going to make it, but you know, price of gold can change that. Um, or something can happen. Yeah, and you know, I think it's good to keep that in mind. Something can always happen. But as you mentioned, you are on track to meet guidance for 2023. I believe it's set at 150,000 to 170,000 gold equivalent ounces. And you talked about this a little bit, but I believe for the first half, it was 66,000 gold equivalent ounces. So in the second half of the year, it will have to be a little bit higher. So we are set to be bringing on that higher amount to meet the the overall guidance. That's right. Well, we're likely to be at the lower end of that range of guidance um, rather than the high end, but um, within the guidance range. All right. Thank you for going over that. And also looking back at Q2, there was exciting news from Material Copper with the new PEA for Los Azulos, which is updated from 2017. So, Michael, I wanted to have you go over that a little bit because it seems like, from what I understand, there's a pretty big overhaul in many ways, one of which is the sweet switch to now a heat leach operation. So I wondered if you could talk about that and why you made that decision. Sure. So, um, first of all, this is our fourth PEA. Uh, we have looked at different flow sheets to see what is optimal um, in the area. 
what is optimal in terms of financials for our share and stakeholders. And uh, looking at it, we decided that um, we would like to have a mine built for the future, a mine with a low carbon footprint, a mine with no water consumption. Um, usually what is built in, in those areas are mills um, with flotation and then storage of the milled um, tailings and tailing storage facilities. Um, they can be um, they can be difficult to manage um, and they consume a lot of water. Um, and we said, okay, what, what is it that we can do? And we gave up a little bit on our profitability saying, well, in the beginning, we may not recover the gold and silver that, I um, mean, in our case, it's, it's not a relevant part of our mineralization in favor of the environment. Yeah. Um, we now have, um, a mine, um, and vision, uh, that is producing 670 kilos per ton of copper in terms of CO2. We aim to have net zero by 2038. Um, this 670 means that we are in the lowest water when it comes to carbon intensity. You know? And this is the outcome of uh, selection of the production flow sheet on one hand and our works together with YPF, YPF being the oil and gas company in, in Argentina that offered us a 100% renewable and uh, is actually doing the engineering and um, uh, work towards uh, financing of the power line to our side, so that's that's very helpful. Then, in terms of in terms of water, um, we look at water consumption of about 137 liters per second, uh, which is well below this 600 to 800 liters per second type of constant. So, water is important for us. Um, carbon is important for us. Uh, we want to produce something that is industrializable in Argentina directly. Argentina is an industrialized country, produces lots of cars. We have a car shareholder or an automotive um, company as a shareholder that went with us because of our very progressive aims of having a small environmental footprint, but also to deliver the copper that is needed um, in, in, in a finished product form for, uh, for their endeavor for producing electromobility. So that's the biggest change that we have done. It's still a very good uh, PA with an NPV of about 2.7 billion, IRR 1%, payback in 3.2 years, which is very quick for this kind of projects at $3.75 per pound of copper, which is within, uh, within guidance, and the relatively low capex of 2.5 billion. If you compare this to concentrators, a concentrator would use about five to six billion dollars to be built. So we think we have a good trade-off. Uh, we have something that is socially acceptable and can be uh, the mine for the future. We will continue to work on it, continue to improve it in terms of environmental. Okay, really good to be going over that. A follow-up question. So it's really clear that there is this low environmental footprint. You're speaking about Los Azulas as a mine for the future. I was wondering if you're seeing copper end users seeking out more sustainable or green copper. Is this something they want right now, or is it something you think they would definitely want more of in the future? I think people are um, more and more ESG focused. Um, they want to have ethical production. They want to have low uh, environmental footprint production. We think that at some point in the future, you may actually be able to command a premium for what we call green copper, copper that is produced with renewables, with low environmental and low carbon uh, emissions. So we are prepared to deliver that. Um, it's not uh, in our um, uh, price. We just use um, uh, the normal copper price going forward. But we think that this will be a very thought after commodity in the future and not a lot of mines been produced. I, I just to add there, Charlotte, if I may, the... Uh... With global trade getting fragmented because of geopolitical tensions, um, people, various manufacturers are looking, they need to diversify their supply chain. And they're looking through their supply chain and looking at, well, how green is a product that they're buying from their suppliers. And we saw that with Stellantis when they came in. Um, they wanted to be carbon neutral by 2038, and they want all their suppliers to be that way as well. So there's a lot of pressure 
on the people who provide the metals, the people that provide have manufactured some of the parts from those metals, all the way through, including even the transportation. And as as Michael was saying, that um, we're p- going to be producing a cathode, copper cathode, which can be used immediately for manufacturing, whereas most copper mines are producing a concentrate that has to go to a smelter, so transported to a smelter, then a lot of heat applied to it to turn it into a copper ingot and then shipped on. So um, we feel we have an advantage, but I, I would say all of the automobile manufacturers are doing that right now. Uh, and there'll be a lot of other manufacturers who are supplying the auto manufacturers that have to do it as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, great, great points from both of you. I think it's clear that this is a trend that's happening now and will continue to develop. So. We've been talking about Los Azulas, of course, as a copper operation, but Rob, you have an interesting way of looking at it from your more gold perspective. So I was wondering if you could outline that for us, how you might want to look at it if you're more of a gold-focused investor. Thank you, Charlotte. Well, I do look at that. Every time I look at a deposit that's not a gold deposit, I do a little calculation to figure out, well, what would be the, what would this amount to as a gold equivalent project? So. When I look at Los Azulas, I mean, we increased the resources by 37% in, over the, in the PEA. So there's 37.6 billion pounds of copper. And if you were to divide the gold price by the copper price, you come up with a ratio. And recently it was 500 to one. And if you divide that into 37.6 billion, you end up with a deposit that's equivalent to a 75 million ounce gold deposit. Now, if you look at the annual production and do the same type of calculation, you're saying, well, the first five years of production of Los Azulas will be 800,000 ounces a year. And thereafter, for the next 22 years, it'll be about 640,000 ounces. The cost of production, um, it's going to be $1.07 cash for producing a pound of copper. That translates into about 550 or five hundred and call it forty dollars an ounce cash cost and eight hundred and twenty all in sustaining costs. And you go, all right, two point five billion dollar investment, payback in three point two years, you run for twenty seven years, and you're at the bottom of the cost curve, whether it's in the copper industry or the gold industry. And I look at that and say, Well, if I had a gold deposit like that, I really like it. But we have a copper deposit like that, and I really like that too because it's um, it's quite a powerful asset. Yeah, I think you can definitely see that coming through. It's really interesting to look at it from both of those sides. Going back to copper, I have another question for Michael, which is about, you know, we've been talking today and in previous conversations about how important copper is for the energy transition. And I think governments around the world are starting to recognize that. You're seeing copper show up on critical minerals lists around the world. But there are differences in how it's classified. Some countries consider it critical, some of them don't. So my question is, are these lists helpful? Do you think that we'll see more governments start to recognize the importance of copper moving forward? What are your thoughts there? I think that uh, copper plays an important role in human development, in electrification of our energy grids and in the amounts required are just eye watering uh, going forward. It's just massive. Um, I see that uh, companies are adding uh, copper to, to the critical minerals list. There are um, mining entrepreneurs that are saying copper is a matter of national security. And um, I think so as well. If you look where you have the smelters in, in today's world and a lot of mines are producing uh, concentrate, we are going to produce cathodes. So our product can be directly used. Um, then this is pretty much Asia centric. Now uh, you see the difference between the U.S. and Asia, and you're saying, well, wait a minute, uh, maybe it would be good to have um, some copper mines as well in North America, or at least in countries that um, on very friendly terms uh, with North America and Europe. Um, then uh, you see that. Um, the U.S. just added uh, copper to the critical minerals list. Yeah, that was, I don't know, a week or two weeks ago. On the other hand, you don't see 
projects moving through permit. Yeah. So there's a dichotomy, I would say, in between what the administrations are saying and what the bureaucratic machinery is doing. Time to market for copper mine is very, very long. Yeah. So uh, 2015, 2030, that seems very long away. Um, but this is this is Formula One pace. Yeah, if, if you look at it from a miners' perspective, we want to be in production 2028, 2029. This is Formula One. Yeah. So uh, and and we are in a jurisdiction where we believe we can uh, we can build and operate the mine relatively quick. Now you try to do the same in in some other jurisdictions. And you look in permitting times that go from five to 10 years. So I think governments need to understand that it's not only wishing for copper supply to appear, it actually needs actually on the ground, needs corporately sourced to the regulators. There needs to be political willingness to build responsible mines going forward. And it's better, from my point of view, uh, to build them in your backyard where you have them on the Goal, then to put them in some remote location. And when I mean remote locations, I'm not talking about Argentina. Argentina has long standing mines in the province we're in, uh, has lots of experience. I mean, general experience. So I think that um, it is positive that um, governments around the world uh, declare copper as a critical mineral. It is. Um, but uh, I would like to see more actions following those expectations. That makes a lot of sense. We need that follow-up action after the words. So as we're finishing up here, you know, I'm always reading comments from our viewers on our YouTube channel. And I know that people are looking for advice that they can act on. They're, they're curious to know what they can do right now. And so, Rob, as we're finishing up, I wondered if you could share your advice, words for investors as we're heading into the back half of 2023. I'll... Um shape my comments by saying I believe that inflation is not going away anytime soon. So I believe investors should be adding to their portfolio items that we need to live with and assets that preserve value. So I would suggest that they think of adding to their portfolio exposure to uh, foods and grains, to energy, and to precious metals. And there are many vehicles to do that in, and it depends on your risk profile. But we're going to need all of those. And if we get into an inflationary environment, the prices of all of those are going up. So Very good. And Michael, of course, the same question for you, your advice for investors. I think um, I'm very much aligned with Rob. You want to go into copper? Um, there are a couple of copper developers out there. You want to go into copper with uh, Metuan Mechion Mining, um, a big part of uh, Mechion Mining is 52% ownership in Mechion Copper, so that's a way to get exposure. Um, and um, you get uh, gold and silver on top of the copper exposure. So I think that um, going in this direction um, is, um, is a healthy move because we will see increase in prices going forward. We are very much convinced of that. Great. Well, I think we can wrap it up there. Thank you both so much for coming on to talk about what's going on with gold and copper, the Q and mining, the Q and copper. Always great to have you on and hope to do it again soon, of course. Thank you, Charlotte. Pleasure to see you. Thank you, Charlotte. It was of great. Course. It was great. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with investingnews.com. And this is Rob McEwen and Michael May. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We'd also love to hear your thoughts, so leave us a comment below. We'll see you next time.